Let's just uh, jump right into the Word this morning. You'll turn with me to Acts chapter 3, or we'll show on the screen here. Acts chapter 3, verse 11. That's where we were last week. That's far as we made it last week. We did the one verse. Uh, I'm going to try to cover some ground today. Uh, we'll, we'll see how far we get. I'm not sure I'm going to get all the way done with what I would like to, but we're going to do our best. <laughs> yeah, we're far cry from a, a chapter a week. But, uh, that's okay, though. It's, you know, each time, pretty much, we have a different subject, so um, I'm okay with that. All right, let me go ahead and read verse 11 to you again. Now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John. That's what we talked about last week. How they held on, they clung to, they adhered to, they wrapped their arms around. And they were, this lame man wasn't going anywhere. He was a perpetual photo bomber. Everywhere they were, he was. And we're going to see him again uh, here. We're going to see him again in chapter 4. Uh, he became part of of Peter and John. It says, All the people ran together to them on the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. They were amazed. And Peter was like, Why are you amazed? You've seen miracles. You know what God did. You've read the Scriptures. I know why you're amazed, because you think we did this. No, 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 we did not do this. Verse 12. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? Peter says, Do you think we could possibly do this? John and me? Do you think we can heal this man? No, a thousand times no. It's not by our power. It's not by our godliness that this man walks. Peter could have said, you should have seen me a few months ago. I was a wreck. I, I cursed and denied that I even knew this man. You think we did this? We didn't do this. But he loved me even though I did that. He forgave me even though I did that. He filled me with his Holy Spirit. And that's why I can stand before you here today and preach this message to you. Amen. I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but it's what he said. Then he goes on in verse 13. Look, we've already covered more ground than we did last week. <laughs> verse 13. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified His servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. Now, you have to understand, this is how the Jews would begin their prayers. They would say, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers. That's how they would always begin their prayers. When I say God, what do you think? You probably, you might think, you know, he's a kind of a gray-haired guy that sits up on a big throne and, and uh, you know, he's wise and he's, he's old and he's, he's, you know, got gray hair. But we really need to realize when we're talking about God, we're talking about the Godhead. We're talking about the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But you see, at this time, what Peter was saying to them, this is not a new thing. We're talking about the God of our fathers. He glorified His servant Jesus, and you denied Him. You put Him to death. Now, there's a couple of things I want us to look at right here. It says He glorified His servant. Isn't that odd? Mean, Jesus is part of the Godhead. He's just as much God as God the Father is. He's just as much God as God the Holy Spirit is. And the Holy Spirit is just as much God as Jesus is. And as God the Father is. They are God. I don't understand the Trinity. Well, welcome to the club. But I know it's in there. We have finite minds. It's, it's hard sometimes to comprehend. 
You know, the best way I can comprehend the Trinity is not a very spiritual application. But you heard me say before, <laughs> any Star Trek fans in here? You know, we're bored. We are bored. You know, they all collectively are one, even though there are many. Well, you know, God, the Godhead is collectively one, even though there are distinct, three distinct personalities. But there are one essence, and they are one. So, how does he glorify his servant, Jesus? Well, what happened was, the father is like, who will go? And, and the son said, I'll go. So they took the boat and said, okay, you go. You'll be the best one. So the son came. He's no less God than the rest of them, but he became the servant of God, the father, to come and do the work of the son on our behalf. He came to serve human beings. Isn't that amazing? That God would come and serve us. But that's what he chose to do. That was his nature. But I had to do for that's also the nature of the Father. That's also the nature of the Holy Spirit. He didn't change his nature. He's still who he was. He just took the form of, of flesh to come and minister to us. Then he goes on to say, This God of our fathers glorified his servant. And you know what you did? It says right here, it says, You delivered him up. You denied him. Whom Pilate was determined to let go. There's a good three point message that I don't have time to preach today. It's got three needs delivered up, or denied, delivered up, and determined. I mean, that could preach right there. Maybe another day. We'll touch on it here just for a moment. First of all, it says you delivered him up. Now, what that means is, it means like served him on a platter. I mean, this is not by accident. This is something you were determined to do. You were determined to have Him crucified. You were determined to have Him murdered on that cross. You were determined. You, you, you packaged Him up so that this could happen. You did that, He said. You were determined to do that. You denied the very one, the God of our fathers, glorified as His servant. You denied Him. You delivered him up. And listen to what he says. He goes on to say, uh, in the presence of Pilate, listen, when he, Pilate, was determined to let him go, Pilate was trying to get him away out. He tried everything he could. He said, I don't find this man guilty of anything worthy of this. Just be amazing. Why don't you let him go? We don't want to let him go. And then, and then on top of it, Pilate's wife. I have a bad feeling. I have a bad feeling. You know, I learned to listen. To my spouse sometimes. <laughs> I need to learn to listen to her more often. Yes, uh, Amen. Well, I, had a, I had a pastor friend of mine, John Thomas. He said, usually you can determine the attitude of people by your wife. I'm in trouble. So I just want to apologize to all of you right now. <laughs> but his wife, Pilate's wife, I had a dream. I, you know, she's, she's like, this, this man, it, he could be a God, and, and you can't do anything bad to him. So Pilate's like, man, I really want to let this guy go. So what does Pilate do? He tries to make it where they'll have to let him go. He goes and gets the meanest, ugliest, murdering, thief, robber, whatever. I mean, this guy was bad news. Barabbas. Bad news. He says, surely, if I give them a choice between Barabbas and and Jesus, this Prince of Peace, this man of life, if I give him, a, give them a choice, surely they will pick Jesus. But no, what did they do? We want Barabbas! We want Barabbas! But what about this man? Crucify him! Crucify him! You delivered him up! You served him up on a platter! You denied him! Whom the God of our fathers glorified. And there he goes again. Preaching one of those seeker sensitive messages. That's not a popular message for your second sermon, is it? There you go, sir. It's good, good stuff. <laughs> Verse 14. But you denied the Holy One. You denied the just 
And you ask for a murder to be granted to you. And you kill the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. You ask for this Jesus to be put to death in place of this murderer. You killed Him. But God, God raised Him from the dead. In verse 16, I'm going to kind of switch gears here. And His name, through faith in His name, has made this man stronger. That man is still, he didn't go anywhere, did he? He's still there. Whom you see and know. You know this guy. Remember we talked about that last week. You know this guy. This wasn't some fake evangelist that came through town. You know this guy. You've seen him for 40 years. You know what's been done here. Yes, faith which comes through Him has given Him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Notice it says, He says His name. That name is a powerful name. The name of Jesus is powerful. But you don't, you don't just say Jesus and like magic, something will happen. I know people like that. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Nothing magical about the name of Jesus. What it is is the authority that is in the name of Jesus. Because it says, and his name through faith in his name. You see, it's not so much saying Jesus, it's, it's the faith that is involved when you say Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. It says, through faith in his name. This is how it all happened. It wasn't us that did this. It was believing in and having faith in Jesus Christ that made this thing happen. Jacob, if you put up Mark 16 for me, verses 17 and 18. I want to talk about that name just for a, a few moments this morning. In, in uh, Mark 16, 17 and 18. It reads, And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name. Yes. There that name is again. The powerful name of Jesus. Faith in His name. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. You see, church, it's in His name and faith in His name. Jesus said, I'm going away. He said, all authority has been given unto me both in heaven and on earth. But now, He says, I'm going away. So you go in my name. You go in my authority. You lay hands on the sick and they will recover. You shall cast out devils in my name. Amen. And when you do it, don't you dare take the glory for it. Yeah. 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 Don't you dare think you're the great healer. No, He's the great healer. You're a garden hose and He's just pouring Himself through. I don't believe this, but I remember when I was in Bible college, Dr. Brooke, my, my professor, he was the president of college at the time, he said, if you take glory for God's work, He'll kill you. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, I don't necessarily agree with that, but I'm still not going to take glory. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Let's go back to verse 17. I'm making some ground. Verse 17, Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. Now what he's saying here is you didn't know what you were doing, but you did it. You did kill the prince of life. Verse 18. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Now, here's what you've got to grab hold of. <clears throat> It was God's plan that Jesus died as a sacrificial lamb. From the very beginning, that's why, you know, you think, I don't like reading the book of Leviticus. All it talks about is he sacrifices blood. But you have to understand Leviticus, all those sacrifices and blood were pointing to the ultimate sacrifice, which is Jesus Christ, who died to pay for sin once and for all. Hmm. You see, so there, there is purpose in all that reading. I know it's hard to read sometimes, but every now and then you need to go ahead and read through books like Leviticus. And keep that in mind. 
Well, what he's saying is God had a plan for this to happen. But that doesn't redeem you because God didn't cause you to do it. He just knew what you would do. Hmm. This was prophesied years earlier that the Son of God would suffer and die to pay the price for the sin of the world. Jacob, you pull up Isaiah 53. I'm going to just take a moment to go ahead and read this. Isaiah chapter 53. This is talking about the Son of God. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? I need to hope you have a go. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of the dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon Him, and by His stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to His own way, and the Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and He was afflicted, yet He opened not His mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before His shearers is silent. So He opened not His mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He, was, he has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. You know who that's speaking to? We realize what he has done for us. We need to just ponder on that sometimes. You know? We need to read Isaiah 53. Just ponder. I don't think I need to preach it to you. I think it preaches itself. But we need to just open our hearts and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you've done for me. Let's go. Father, we are just so in awe of you. that you would give up everything. Come and serve those that hated you, despised you, were your enemies. That you came and you fulfilled everything that was needed to pay the price for our sins. Lord, we're thankful today. Let us never forget the ultimate sacrifice that you made. But Lord, we're so thankful that we don't have to stop there. We're thankful that it did not end on the cross. It did not end when they put you in the ground. It did not end when you went to the lower parts of the earth 
and preach to the captives. It did not end whenever you came back to the earth. We know, Lord, that you are now ascended on high. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. And you are making intercession for us. And Lord, we think that by your name we can come boldly to the throne of grace to ask for mercy to help in time of need. Lord, we thank you that you are our great high priest because you have been here and you have been through it. And you can have compassion upon each and every one of us. Lord, we thank You that You feel our pain when we're in pain. We thank You that You feel our joy when we're in joy. So Lord, we thank You for providing the opportunity for us to have a relationship with You. We thank You for that relationship. We thank You, Lord. We praise You, Lord.